All right, thank you everybody for attending Grand Rounds remotely today. Our speaker is Dr. Jeremy Siegel, who is joining us from the University of Chicago, where he is an associate professor in the Department of Pathology and director of the Division of Genomic and Molecular Pathology. He is an expert in molecular methodologies, including NGS, and the application of those methods in the somatic realm across cancers. He has an extensive publication record in molecular findings in both hematologic malignancies as well as solid tumors. And he has a really exciting multi-institutional collaborative effort he's, that he's leading that I think will be very impactful for the field of molecular pathology, but I won't spoil the details and we'll let him share all of that with you. Um, with that, thank you for being here and welcome Dr. Siegel. Thanks, thanks a lot. Hi everybody. Um, thanks for inviting me. It would, it would have been nicer to uh, get out of my house and be able to come visit you guys, but um, you know, it's the way it goes. And it's uh, nice to have a chance to talk about something other than COVID uh, for once. It feels like um, it's actually nice to go and look at these slides and remember that I'm, I'm supposed to be uh, an oncology molecular pathologist instead of a, a sort of a, a virology pretender where our dean wants us to bring on some different methods for COVID detection. And so I've just been dealing with that for the past, uh, so, you know, however much time and I'm sure everybody else has as well. Anyway. Okay. So this, <clears throat> uh, this is a talk about a collaborative effort um, that I've started together with Dara Eisner from the University of Colorado. And uh, it's really part of an effort to uh, do a bit better as academic centers working together for, uh, you know, genomics advancement rather than sort of, you know, individually competing with each other. Um, and it's something we've been working on for some time now. And uh, so I'll go through, you know, what that is and what we've been doing. Uh, but I'm going to get started by just sort of talking about a little bit of background and sort of the, the reasons why I think it's important that academic centers do a bit more to work together. Um, and I'm hopefully sort of preaching to the choir on this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Um, so here we go. Um, and when I was, uh, <clears throat> when I was a resident, um, I, you know, I, I volunteered to work in the molecular lab and I was, um, I, I was, you know, working at the time, you know, the, the big things in molecular testing, you know, around 2008 were um, EGFR and KRAS mutations and lung cancer. Uh, and so I was working on Sanger sequencing for those and, you know, I was, you know, it was pretty exciting at the time. Those were our only markers. Uh, but, you know, I think it, it still seemed pretty cool back then, but I don't think we had any clue, certainly had no clue, you know, how much next generation sequencing was going to impact uh, what, what we do on a daily basis and how we do our jobs. Um, and it's amazing to see how much has changed in, in lung cancer. And lung cancer is probably the, the poster child for uh, molecularly guided um, therapy in cancer, uh, because you know today we have this huge number of uh, markers that our clinicians ask us to look for, and it's not just that they're interested. You know, there's you know there's clinical relevance to to many of these. Um, so we've got mutations, we've got small uh, insertions and deletions, large deletions. There's big deletions in MET exon 14 that cause activation of MET. We have copy number alterations. Um, a growing list of gene fusions that started with ALK and is continuing to expand. Um, and now these uh, sort of genome-wide metrics that are interesting, including you know, microsatellite instability, tumor mutational burden, mutational patterns. Um, so there's really more and more and more that we're being asked to do. And, uh, you know, the, the specimens get trickier and trickier. There's really only one way that you can do these things, and that's using next-gen sequencing to do them all at once. And uh, the... Uh, the clinical relevance is, is continuing to grow as well. I've, you know, this may, slide may even be a little bit outdated in terms of what's approved for all of these different um, things. I tried to put it in bold if it was approved by the FDA as treatment for one of these different markers. But it's really like, a, you know, sort of a, an amazing explosion of knowledge and even um, treatment, you know, options for patients. Um, and, you know, I, I think... Uh, two things about that. Uh, that's great. And that's really what, you know, our lab spends a lot of our time doing is trying to come up with these treatment, you know, uh, markers uh, for patients. And the other thing is, um, you know, I think we get a little bit caught up in this as, you know, the real value of next-gen sequencing. Um, and so, 
uh, for the rest of this talk, really want to ignore all this um, because this is all great for treatment of patients, uh, but it ignores uh, a lot of the useful things about next-gen sequencing that, that kind of get overlooked. Um, you know, I gave a little bit of a short talk at ASCO. I was supposed to do talking for, you know, genomics for the practicing, you know, uh, oncologist. And, you know, as I started putting together my slides, you know, I was supposed to be showing these oncologists about, you know, how to order molecular tests and how to review molecular tests and all that stuff. And as I was putting together my slides, I just got more and more frustrated because, you know, I really regard this as pathology work. Um, and what's the advantage in, you know, propping up a system that excludes pathologists uh, from, from participating in a, in, a, in a lot of ways? Uh, I think we've kind of gotten into this at, at many places. And hopefully this isn't the case at a lot of academic centers, but certainly in the community um, we're, we've gotten into this where, you know, the specimen comes out and it goes to us in pathology and we make a diagnosis. Um, and then at a lot of places, that's where the pathologist's involvement in molecular testing ends. Uh, the diagnosis goes to the oncologist. <clears throat> the oncologist decides to order a molecular test for treatment purposes. The report comes back and the report goes to the oncologist and often the pathologist never even sees it. Um, and, you know, then the, the oncologist decides to move forward with whatever therapy and, and that's become you know, sort of the de facto model of how molecular testing is done. And it's, it's not good. And, and the more that we find uh, that we're involved in doing our own testing, I mean, doing the testing ourselves and communicating with our other pathologists and communicating with our oncologists, more and more we find that, you know, as results, whether it's a report from somewhere else or whether it's our own results, preferably our own results, um, it comes back to us and it makes us change how we feel about the, the entire case. Uh, and uh, that can often lead to an entirely different diagnosis. And that's huge, right? That takes, you know, that feeds back and, and could completely alter the, the, the treatment. Um, so there's a lot more than just these, um, these you know, standard treatment markers. It's, it's a whole pathology operation. <clears throat> so we find that more and more we would like to be involved in actually ordering the tests. And that's something I do in my own lab is try as much as possible to set up situations where pathologists can order these tests, both for, um, you know, helping make the diagnoses as well as just, you know, looping it into regular pathology practice. So for our lung cancers, uh, we've got an agreement with oncology now where we just go ahead and, um, uh, make it a reflex test. So, uh, you know, our, our pathologists see lung biopsies and lung FNAs and they, you know, we've got an agreement. They just go ahead and put through the orders and then it becomes, you know, a guaranteed team effort. So there's a lot of um, utility for NGS and I'm sure you guys all agree uh, for just making a basic diagnosis rather than, you know, guiding, guiding particular therapies. So um, <clears throat> there are molecularly defined entities. We're seeing that more and more in heme malignancies and brain tumors particularly where the diagnosis is named based on the molecular findings. So you really need the molecular testing for that. Um, and there's a lot of times where there's tricky differentials where, you know, you would apply IHC to try to figure out if it's one thing or another. And really molecular testing should be right up there with IHC as a, as a useful way to, to sort out difficult cases. Um, and then the special cases of, you know, is this a metastasis versus a second primary? And there's often no other way other than molecular testing to try to sort those things out. And those are really impactful for patients as well. <clears throat> so just to give a little bit of overview of what we do in our lab. Um, uh, so this is the panel that we developed over the past few years. Um, and we call it our OncoPlus panel. It's a hybrid capture sequencing panel of... 1,213 genes, um, and it's grouped into a couple of tiers, and we don't report uh, findings from all of these genes because that would be uh, that would be too stressful and horrendous. And you know, the truth about cancer uh, and genetic testing right now is there's only a certain number of genes that we really understand well enough to be able to really say something about from uh, the point of view of you know either diagnosis or therapy. So we're reporting currently uh, mutations in uh, 154 of the genes. And, you know, we mine some other things out of here as well. These are really versatile panels. So we're mining the copy number out of it. Uh, we have metrics for microsatellite instability. Uh, we've built in probes in this for tumor-associated viruses. So we get to pull all of this data on every case that we run. 
we have a, a limited set of genes that we use for gene fusions in this panel. And the reported ones from this panel are ALK, RET, and ROS1. We have a uh, RNA-based panel that we use uh, for you know, some additional fusions. And tumor mutational burden, how many mutations are present per megabase. So with that in mind, I'll just go through, I just have a couple of cases just to sort of show um, some of the utility here. Uh, we had this case last year. Um, it's a 63-year-old female uh, with a pancreatic mass, um, and it was judged to be adenocarcinoma on FNA. And this patient had a prior, you know, more remote history of cervical squamous cell carcinoma, and there was a question mark of whether this was a MET. Um, and, uh, you know, they did a P40 stain and a couple of other immunostains, and it really didn't look um, like a like a squamous cell carcinoma, and it was uh, ended up uh, signed out as an adenocarcinoma, and so you know the patient went down to you know being treated based on um, pancreatic cancer protocols. Um, <clears throat> so we got this one just you know to try to find uh, pancreatic cancer markers, and it was provided to us as a pancreatic uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, <clears throat> and you know we we did our test and. The only thing that we really found of interest was a HER2 amplification, which was kind of surprising because, you know, in the vast majority of these things, you know, you've got a KRAS mutation, and you don't always, but it was a little bit strange, and we started looking a little bit more. Um, and one of the things we looked at was the tumor-associated virus uh, information. Um, and usually, in every case, we really don't see anything. We have extra, you know, fake chromosomes built into our reference genome that have... Um, the sequence of all these viruses in it. So if virus sequence uh, arises when we do the DNA alignment to the genome, if there is a virus finding, it will align to that you know chromosome. Um, and so you can just look at each one of the different viruses and see how many uh, sequences align to them. And for most of these viruses, there's nothing. Uh, but you can see here HPV 16, we actually had 4 million sequencing reads um, positive for HPV 16 in this case. And we only do about 30 million sequencing reads. So more than 10% of all of the data in this patient sample came from HPV-16, which is um, something we see a lot um, in HPV. Uh, you know, either we see a huge pile of reads like this, or we see uh, less reads with a clear um, actual genomic insertion point. Uh, this seems to be um, episomal um, type of situation, which we see, I think, you know, more frequently than we might otherwise expect. Um, but at any rate, that sort of makes this a, a metastatic cervical cancer until proven otherwise. And they went back and they did some additional IHCs, and they found that the original uh, lesion had a couple of um, little areas of poor differentiation that lost a lot of these squamous cell markers. Um, and then this MET was arising from one of those areas. So... Um, you know, this changes the whole, you know, situation for the patient, and it's something that's really only going to come up um, by casting a wide net for this case. <clears throat> uh, another case, we had um, this 79-year-old guy with this scapular soft tissue lesion, um, and, you know, they, this was a tricky one. It's some sort of spindle cell lesion, and based on IHC, uh, the anatomic pathologist ended up uh, coming down to a, a choice between uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor and a uh, metastatic melanoma. And they ended up favoring MPNST just based on some of the IHC findings. Um, and this patient had a, uh, a lung metastasis. And so we ended up testing that. <clears throat> and uh, so in terms of findings that we got from it, um, we got a, a decent list of pathogenic findings. You can see there's a number of different mutations here. None of them are particularly helpful for trying to sort this out. Um, there's mutations in NF1 and NF2, but you can see those in MPNSTs, and you can also see them in melanomas, so it's not super helpful. Um, but you know, here's our list of variants of uncertain significance, and you can see that it's a fairly long list. Um, this is longer than we get in most cases, and this is a longer number of mutations than we see in most cases. Um, and the variants of uncertain significance can be either um, you know, benign you know, SNPs, typically rare inherited ones, or they can be somatic. But this is too long, and it suggests there's a lot of somatic mutations just going on in this case. So when we uh, analyzed it for tumor mutational burden, um, we ended up with 86 per mutations per megabase, which is very high. Um, more than 10 is considered high. And you can see the distribution of uh, tumor mutational burden across a lot of different tumor types here. The red bar is where this case is. So it's high even for melanoma. Um, 
And it's important because uh, cases with high tumor mutational burden are presumed to potentially have more neoantigens, which might lead to better immune system recognition. And there's this general thought that cases with high tumor mutational burden uh, may respond better to immunotherapy. Um, but one other thing you can do when you have a case that has a high tumor mutational burden is you can ask, well, what kind of mutations are actually present here? Um, <clears throat> And you can look at the mutational signatures. So mutational signatures are, are interesting. It, it's basically like, uh, what is the biologically driven pattern of mutational base preferences here? Certain types of, you know, uh, mutagenic, uh, you know, effects will produce different types of mutations. So if you have polymerase E mutations, you'll see a lot of C to A changes. Um, and if you have, you know, smoking, you'll see a variety of different things. Um, so you, you can look, and the way this is done is by grouping the mutations that you see by what is the, um, you know, the main base change, and then subdividing them by what are the bases that are around the mutation. Is it a C and a T after and before the mutation or, or whatnot? And you can zoom this in and see. So in this particular case, you have C to A mutations, and they are subdivided by what are the bases before and after where the mutation is present. So if you have enough mutations, you can generate one of these plots for the case. And so that's what we did in this case. And this is what we got. So we got primarily C to T mutations um, and with the particular, you know, context preference. Uh, and if you ask you know, which, which mutational, you know, uh, pattern is this most similar to, um, it's a, almost a perfect match for signature seven, um, <clears throat> which is the signature that comes from ultraviolet light exposure. So we found this to be useful um, in a number of different cases. We see uh, squamous cell uh, carcinomas in the lung that have this, and um, that means it's most probably metastasis from a skin cancer. We see that same type of thing, um, you know, in, in head and neck cases. Um, so there's, uh, you know, a variety of different times where this has been impactful for actually changing the diagnosis of a case. And the fact that this is this case in particular had this, um, you know, made it a little bit more, quite a bit more likely, <clears throat> sorry, that the case is actually a melanoma rather than an MPNST. And this patient had just started on a sarcoma treatment regimen that went very poor, poorly, and he was in the ICU with complications from it. They discontinued the sarcoma protocol and started him on immunotherapy. And he had a really wonderful response to it. And a year and a half later, he was in great shape and he was complaining that his PSA was too high. So if you've got an 81-year-old guy now complaining that his PSA is too high when he had some sort of, you know, um, melanoma or sarcoma before, you're doing pretty good. So this was, this was a nice case. Um, <clears throat> one other thing we do, we actually use the same hybrid capture system that we do for our DNA, and we use it for RNA, and that's how we find our fusions. Um, so we're actually looking across 1,200 genes for fusions. Um, and if you have, a, you know, an anchor gene of interest, for example, NTRK, and it's fused to a partner gene, you're going to have RNA fragments where you have that fusion present. So if we take random fragments of RNA and we add adapters to them, eventually we will get, you know, fragments like this. And if we do enough sequencing, we'll be able to see them. Um, we pull out the fragments that we get using capture probes to the anchor genes of interest and we sequence. And so theoretically that allows us to detect any fusions in any gene on the panel. Having said that, uh, this panel is only currently validated for NTRK and FGFR fusion. So it's probably the world's most expensive NTRK fusion detection system. Um, but at any rate, whenever we run one of these things, um, <clears throat> We uh, mine all of the data that we get for all the genes just to see if we find something interesting. And if we find something interesting, we let the oncologist know and we give them options for going ahead and trying to, you know, do a, a full like CLIA confirmation of the results that we get. And, you know, the goal over time is to expand the number of officially reported genes. But this has been a handy tool for us to just find weird things and, and help make, you know, diagnosis for some of these difficult cases. Um, <clears throat> So one case, we had a 12-year-old male uh, with a lower back soft tissue tumor, um, and it's some kind of uh, sarcoma. Um, it's, you know, cells are a bit plump. There's not a lot of mitoses. It's not all that exciting looking. Um, and so it had a, a, a sort of a broad differential um, that they were trying to work through in anatomic pathology, um, including synovial sarcoma, MPNST, Ewing's, rhabdomyosarcoma, others. It wasn't really clear what it was, and so they just sent it to us to see if we could find anything. Um, 
and we ended up finding something that was fairly interesting, a, a fusion between B core and CCMD3. Um, you know, maybe I was supposed to know what that was beforehand, but I'd never heard of it. And so when it popped up, you know, the first thing I did was go to Google and try to see, is this something you know, that, that means something? And it turns out that it really did. Um, this is a, a disease defying entity for a new, um, you know, uh, uh, fusion specific uh, type of uh, sarcoma that seems to have a uh, male predominance and sort of undifferentiated around cell sarcoma um, and a decent prognosis. So, um, you know, going from having no idea what it was to having a, you know, molecularly guided diagnosis, um, you know, when it wasn't even something that was particularly expected was very nice and handy. So <clears throat> I think, you know, it's, it's important to sort of recognize that these genomics technologies, they've been a critical, become a critical tool for, for sort of daily pathology use. Um, and we've seen a lot of benefit towards uh, testing more specimens, including more features of interest into our large scale sequencing panels, just to allow us to pick up interesting new stuff. Um, I think, you know, molecular studies should be considered more frequently for resolving some of these difficult differentials in the same way that people turn to IHC. Uh, and, you know, the more samples that we sequence, the more patients that we look at, the more interesting things that we find. And, you know, we don't know exactly who's going to benefit from, from uh, trying to do one of these analyses. And so um, I've become more and more of a believer in trying to get to the point where we're doing even routine testing in molecular specimens. And I know we don't get paid for it and there's problems with insurance and all of that stuff, but it seems like um, it's really the best thing to do for not even just making treatment decisions, but, you know, refining and making sure that the diagnosis is correct. So <clears throat> because it's such an important pathology tool, it's really critical that we figure out ways to keep this testing capability within our academic pathology departments. And unfortunately, that's something that is um, substantially at risk. Um, I gave a similar talk at UPenn, and so I added this Rocky slide. And then uh, I really like the slide, so I just left it in because I, <clears throat> I feel like uh, you know, Rocky here is a bit like academic molecular pathology, and uh, Ivan Drago is just about everything else in the country, um, including, you know, all of our costs. The FDA wants to oversee us, and, you know, they're interested in quality, but the way they're going to do it is to drive us out of business by making it cost too much. CMS isn't really helping us. The payers are pushing CMS to not help us. The device manufacturers are trying to force us to buy more expensive kits and take our LDTs offline. Commercial labs are trying to compete with us and sending lobbying money to various other places to, to make things more difficult. Venture capital funds that support you know, some of these startups are you know, not particularly helpful, both because they're trying to lobby against us and because they're flaunting some of the standards that force us to then you know, be regulated by the FDA. CAP isn't even very much helping us because they've decided they might want to try to cash in as a third party reviewer for the FDA. So um, nobody's really helping us out and we're going to have to start helping ourselves. <clears throat> One of the things that's most difficult um, is that, you know, we have a lot of power and expertise and of abilities amongst ourselves as academic centers, but we have not used that. We've been mostly competing with each other or working independently in silos to generate these uh, genomic tests. And the result is that everybody's got a different test. Everybody's gene content is different. Everybody's reportable features are different. There may or may not be differing levels of performance. There's certainly a sense in the community and in ASCO that all of these tests are different and it's kind of like a Wild West mentality. I don't fully believe that. It's certainly, I don't believe that in the academic setting, but I do unfortunately believe that in some of the VC funded startup space. Um, but this uh, you know, thing where we've been all working independently isn't, isn't really helping. And there's so many costs and difficulties in getting these tests online. Um, that you know, it's it's becoming this model of not working together is is not really helping us out anymore. Um, and as we do that, we're slowly getting picked apart by all of these companies. Um, and I don't know, it's just it's just a, a sort of a depressing environment. <clears throat> so uh, that's uh, I'm going to segue into talking about sort of what Dara and I have been working on for um, trying to get academic centers uh, a little bit more on the same page and working together. Uh, in order to um, describe a little bit more stuff, I just have to give a quick overview of hybrid capture sequencing. Um, this is the way that all of the you know, most 
of the large scale sequencing panel we've done. And basically, you start with genomic DNA, you make fragments. Um, you know, we use a Kovaris to just randomly fragment the stuff. And, you know, you've got fragments of genomic DNA, and there may only be certain fragments that you want to sequence. You could do whole genome sequencing, but that would be expensive. So if we only want to sequence these dark blue fragments, uh, then what we do is we make uh, oligos that are specifically designed to bind to those dark blue fragments. Um, and that is the hybrid capture chemistry. Uh, you make a hybridization reaction, and then you can pull down the oligos using um, streptavidin beads and try to wash away all of the light blue fragments. And then you've created an enriched population of dark blue fragments of your genes of interest that then you put on the sequencer and sequence. Now, at the time that we started doing this, the main two methods that people would use in the lab um, were either Agilent or Roche Nimblegen hybrid capture technology. Um, and, you know, both of them are, are approximately the same. Um, what you do is if you wanted to make a hybrid capture assay, a new one, um, you would decide, okay, what genomic territory am I going to cover? So um, here's the KRAS gene. You can see the exons here and the introns are the empty space in between. And let's say we only wanted to sequence um, the exons and the UTRs, we would create um, a bed file, a computer file of locations. So chromosome 12 at a particular start and end, and that's our first exon. And you, so you create this file for all of your genes of interest, um, and that is your genomic territory that you want to cover. And then, you know, if you're using Roche or you're using Agilent, you're going to send them that file, um, and they are going to. Uh, create your hybrid capture panel. And the way they do that um, is with an automated synthesis system, which is a plate-based or array-based synthesizer, where there's all these spots on the array, and they're going to decide what probes they're actually going to make, and they're going to assign to each spot a different oligo to be made. And so all the different oligos for the entire panel are going to all be made together on one plate um, in a single bulk synthesis. And that's great because it's you know relatively easy, but they charge you a lot. So they were charging us somewhere near forty thousand dollars every time we would run one of these things, and that was enough to do about a hundred capture reactions. And we do ten samples per capture reaction, so about a thousand specimens. So we're paying somewhere you know four hundred dollars per capture reaction, or forty to seventy per sample. So that's ten percent of all the costs of doing next gen sequencing. And you know it'd be great, it'd be okay if it, if it worked that well, but unfortunately. It, it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> so here's the sequencing data that you would get from that design. Um, and you can see we now have sequencing data around these exons, and that's great. But you see there's also a couple of problems here where the sequencing data is uh, suboptimal. So let's look at them in turn. This is the first one. This is in the UTR. And we have coverage here, and we have an area in the middle where we don't have enough coverage. Uh, so let's investigate that. So the sequence here seems okay. We just don't have much sequencing data. Um, you know, it's not high GC or anything, but if you look at this sequence and you ask how many times is this sequence present in the reference genome, you get tons of times. You get perfect matches in hundreds of locations. Uh, this is just a you know, sort of a duplicate, duplicative um, bit of sequence that just happens to be in the genome a lot. And you can imagine if you're trying to hybrid to capture this, you've got a probe for this, your sequences, you're going to be binding sequences from all over the genome. And then when you go to align them to the genome, they're going to align to all of these different places. And your particular place isn't going to get that much of them. And so this is just a problem uh, related to the genome itself. You know, we're trying to capture from a place that has many different copies and there's you know, diminishing returns there. And for hybrid capture sequencing, there's just nothing you can do about this. So this is the genome's fault. This is not Roche's fault. Um, but let's look at this other one. Um, here we have, if we you know, blast this in the genome, there's really only one unique place where this binds. So why don't we have sequencing data? And the answer here is that the sequence, uh, if you look at it, has a lot of Gs and Cs. Um, and this uh, is just an issue because that creates secondary structure confirmations and it can make molecular biology kind of difficult. Um, and so what you see is dropout uh, when you use uh, either Roche or Agilent for high GC sequences. Um, <clears throat> so when we asked our rep, they said, well, you know, high GC DNA, it's, it's just uh, difficult to capture and sequence, and so you're kind of out of luck. Um, 
And this was a real problem because if you look at CEBP alpha, which is a critical gene for heme malignancies, it's super GC rich and we just have terrible sequence coverage here. So as we were developing this test, we weren't even sure if we were going to be able to move forward with, um, with any of it because you know, we needed these genes. And so it was, it was sort of a, it was a sort of a dark time in our lab trying to figure out how to do capture sequencing. Um, and so we talked with our rep from IDT and this is a company that just makes oligonucleotides. Um, and they were making, um, you know, biotinylated probes. And they just said, try buying some of our probes and spike them into your reaction. And, you know, based on what we had talked about with uh, Roche, it just didn't seem like that was going to work because they made it seem like the problem was the genomic DNA itself or sequencing it or whatever. And it wasn't, had nothing to do with the probes. Uh, but the IDT people were pretty uh, emphatic about it. So we tried it. Um, and we went from data that looked like this with no coverage here for our exon to having data like this where we had, you know, 1200 X depth and perfect ability to find mutations. And so that was kind of eye opening. Um, <clears throat> and then we got kind of greedy. So, you know, for every gene we would look at it and if we would identify certain areas that we thought had questionable coverage, we would buy some IDT spike in probes and add them and it would fix them. And we did this over a hundred times during our development with, with really nice success. So, um, you know, this was a lifesaver for us. And the question is, you know, sort of why does this work? <clears throat> and the answer is obviously because there's nothing wrong with high GC DNA from the standpoint of capturing it and sequencing it. Uh, the biggest problem actually is these bulk synthesizers are not capable of generating high GC probes because they're difficult to synthesize. Uh, whereas uh, IDT has just has a different method where they sequence or they synthesize each individual probe separately. And then they'll quality control of that particular probe to make sure they know that it was created. You don't have any opportunity to do per spot quality control, so you don't even know when you do this sort of bulk synthesis which probes were successfully made and which ones weren't, and that ultimately becomes a, a real problem. Another nice aspect of the IDT is that you know, just the, the hybridization seems a bit better. So here's an exon of interest that we wanted to sequence, and here is off-target sequencing reads. You know, they don't look like that many, but if you blow them up over 3 billion base pairs of genomic territory, there's a lot of money spent sequencing this stuff out here. And the IDT seems to generate less of it. And you know, if you add it all together, um, that's about 15% of our whole sequencing budget uh, being spent on this stuff. Um, so there's an opportunity to save additional money uh, by looking at this technology. So. Um, so, you know, we asked, you know, what if we just wanted to be like Foundation Medicine and, and the rest of the larger companies and just buy all of our probes in bulk from IDT? Um, so we talked to them, you know, we sent them our design. They said it would be about 50,000 individual probes. Um, and so it would have cost us somewhere around $300,000 to do this, um, which would have been reasonable if we had known it was going to work. But at the time, we really didn't know if it was going to work or not or how it was going to look. And it was a lot to to think about spending that kind of money just to test a new probe technology. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, so we weren't sure about that, but then we asked, you know, well, if we do that, how much do we actually get? Uh, and, you know, remember we're spending about $40,000 every time we do a hundred captures with Roche. Uh, but because you're doing this and buying each individual probe, you're actually buying a ton. So we figured for this $300,000, we were actually getting enough for 3 million reactions or, you know, at 10 reaction, 10 samples of reaction, 30 million samples worth of stuff, um, which is obviously more than we need. We figured it would last us for more than 10,000 years. So it was, you know, it's, uh, but, um, you know, one of the things that quickly came out of that was, well, wait a second, we don't need all of this. We only need a little bit. And so I started talking with Dara um, and the two of us decided um, very quickly, the best thing we could do was try to go out and see, you know, who else might want to uh, be part of that purchase and, and share them. Uh, and so we thought, okay, well, why don't we, we'll get together. Um, she's at University of Colorado and we'll just ask a bunch of the people we know, do they want to participate? Um, and we were kind of hoping that, you know, we would get maybe three other labs to say yes. And then there'd be five of us and it would be, you know, $60,000 a pop. And, you know, that would be great. Uh, and so we asked a bunch of people, we ended up asking about 30, 30 labs and we gave a couple of webinars to see who might be interested. And we were hoping for, you know, just a few, a handful to, to sort of go on what seemed like potentially crazy idea. Uh, and then we ended up getting 17 groups that said yes. So now um, we very quickly got ourselves into the situation of having more groups and more interest and in, in a sort of a larger, more complicated development project than, than, we, than we anticipated. So it was good and bad. Um, 
And so we started out uh, going and trying to just figure out, you know, what, what should we buy if we were going to do this? Um, and and how, should we, how should we manage this? And we ended up calling this group, as we were moving forward, we ended up calling it the Genomic Oncology Academic Laboratory Consortium. Um, and these are the, these are the you know, members of the, the original group. Um, and so the first thing we did is to ask, you know, well, can we all agree on buying the same panel? Do we all want to run the same panel? And it quickly became uh, clear that uh, that was going to be a little bit difficult because everybody already had panels and had different gene content and all of that stuff. Um, so we asked for gene input from each of the sites and wanted to see like how it compared. Maybe there was some consensus that we could come to. Uh, so here's everybody. Here's the number of genes everyone asked for. It was all over the map. Um, we asked for our 1,213. The largest was UT Southwestern asking for 1,407. And, um, you know, how, how do they compare? What, you know, out of everybody's ask, how many genes were unique to that individual group? And, you know, for, for us, 29.3% of the genes we asked for didn't seem interesting to anybody else. Uh, and, you know, similar numbers at, at other places. Some places did better. UCSF did wonderfully. They only asked for 1.4% of the genes that nobody cared about. Um, and uh, I think Hopkins was also, yeah, Hopkins was pretty good as well. Um, so everyone was sort of all over the map. And we ended up looking in about more than half of all the genes that people ended up asking for were present on only one group's list. Um, and so at that point, you know, it was sort of difficult to come up with like an individual panel that we might order. So we just decided we'd go ahead and order everything. So we ended up deciding to go ahead with, you know, 2,640 genes worth of content. Um, oh dear. Okay. Um, we had sort of a breakthrough of how to, how to actually manage this because, you know, we thought we could synthesize all 2,640 genes, but is IDT going to have to pool them just for everybody's individual use and that seemed difficult. We ended up coming up with a nice idea which was that everybody was going to get every gene and everyone was going to get every gene in a single well of a tube. So in this tube here uh, all your probes for KRAS would be in there and all the probes from BRAF would be in here and so you could go through and if you wanted to produce a 1000 gene panel you go through all the plates you pick out the genes of interest and then pipette those all together and so everybody could make whatever panel they wanted to using uh, these basic, uh, you know, reagents. And so that was sort of the, 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 the idea that let us kind of move forward. And so we ended up having a thing where everybody put through their designs and genes of interest. We merged them together. Um, you know, IDT came up with a proposal and we, we refined it because there's some areas that were a little questionable in the genomic content. Um, but all of the funds flowed from the individual labs to IDT directly, so no one of our academic sites had to like act as a manufacturer. Um, then IDT made everything and shipped them out in all of these plates um, to everybody, and they did all of that work in just six weeks, which was pretty cool. Um, so just an example of a panel formulation. If you want to make a thousand gene panel with what you get, um, if you just take one microliter of each of them in a tube, you'd have a thousand microliters um, <clears throat> and you know that would be enough for about a thousand full reactions or 15,000 samples and each site received a hundred times more than that so you know theoretically everybody can do about 1.5 million samples however there's some normalization that needs to be done on some of these so in reality probably people are getting enough for a quarter million samples but still it's um, it's still more than enough to, to do from for many many years um, <clears throat> So there's a you know the nice features of this you know it was cost favorable for everybody. Uh, we figure that we're going to be saving you know probably uh, a couple of thousand dollars per week just on reagents and sequencing reagents. <clears throat> so you know this was an expensive purchase and we wanted to make sure we got it right because we had to design the whole thing. Um, so we decided to do some pilot studies to to check it out. Um, one of the nice things here is that you know we've been using you know, a, a Roche system um, for a couple of years at this point. And so for every sample that we did, we took the fragments, we fragmented, we took the DNA, we fragmented it down, we added adapters to it. And at that point, that becomes a whole genome sequencing library that can be used um, for hybridization capture. So we would take this library and capture it with our Roche probes in sequence. 
Um, but we save the library for every case that we do. So we were able to take the same exact library and not have to worry about the extraction or you know, this tissue or any of that stuff. We still have the exact same library that was used here. And we can buy an IDT probe set and compare using a different hybridization from the same library, capture and sequence and compare results. So we just uh, got a sample of this IDT panel. They had a 127 gene panel. It's not a very well-designed panel. It has some weird genes on it, but that's not really the point. The point was to do some technical comparisons. So we picked some libraries that had some interesting findings um, and sequenced them. There was some question because the probes had different lengths and the hybridization temperatures were different. You know, are we going to still do the same job for pulling down mutant DNA? We just didn't know, um, but it seems like that was working great. And the question was whether at higher temperatures the um, pieces of DNA that had um, insertions or deletions were also going to bind as well to the probes. Uh, and we didn't really have a problem there either. The, the variant percentages that we got for various different sized insertions and deletions were basically identical. So that was nice. Um, and, you know, we, we came up with a few other pilot studies to look at, you know, tiling across the probes of, you know, how many, how many, how much overlapping do we want for probes or do we not want to overlap them? And do we want to overlap them for fusions or not overlap them for fusions? And we did some additional pilot studies there uh, and ended up coming up with our final design, which had, you know, 95,000 <clears throat> individual probes in 2,671 individual pools. So everybody was going to receive like you know, 28 plates times two or 56 plates of stuff. Um, we built in the genes, we built in intron coverage for fusions, we built in tumor-associated viruses, SNPs for identity testing, microsatellite pools, um, and then, you know, we got ready to pull the trigger for this, you know, half million dollar purchase, and Dara and I were really scared about this because, you know, I don't even like spending five dollars of my own money, I've never been in a position to spend a half a million dollars of somebody else's money before, and so we were really worried that, you know, if we spent all this money and came back and none of it worked, that you know, we were going to have to show up to, to the AMP conference with a bag over our head. Um, and so it was a little bit stressful until we got some preliminary data. But the preliminary data was, was really nice. So um, you know, it was delivered. Um, and uh, we had you know, here just some sample data from a couple of genes. Here's EP300. Here's our Roche uh, data. And here's the data from the new IDT probes. And it basically looks identical. Same here uh, with EZH2. Certain genes, as expected, were way better with the IDT. Here's ARID1A exon 1, which is incredibly GC rich. Um, and the raw data that you get with Roche looks like this. And here we're able to sequence the whole thing. So for certain GC areas, the IDT was, was vastly better. Um, and we got the same type of data from other places. This is some data from the University of Vermont, just looking at, you know, comparison. Um, <clears throat> Here's a 100 gene subpool that we created, just showing that we had you know, a nice amount of coverage across, um, across the whole territory. Um, most of the base is covered at a reasonable sequencing level, and Johns Hopkins saw the same kind of thing, and so that was nice. Um, and uh, you know, one thing that was a little worrisome to us was that we saw different depths for different genes. Um, but when we looked at our original panel, we saw different depths for different genes as well. And one of the nice things about the IDT stuff is that you, because each gene is separate, you have the opportunity to spike them in. So here's, you know, our original, you know, variability in gene depths, but then adding three or nine fold concentration of them is able to actually bring them back up to, to different levels. So there's an opportunity to do balancing, um, where you don't have that, um, with, uh, with some of the you know, bulk synthesis methods. <clears throat> um, so today, so we got them, got them, I can't remember, 18 months ago or something like that. Um, there's already four laboratories that have launched assays using these probes. So UT Southwestern has launched a 200 gene heme panel. Ohio State has lost, launched actually two different panels in the 500 gene range, one for heme and one for solid tumor. Uh, University of Washington has launched a panel in the 200 gene range. Hopkins has launched one uh, in the 700 gene range. Um, and many others are in active development and validation. We are just finishing ours. And if it wasn't for COVID, we would have been finished already. But COVID has really um, sort of set our lab back by, you know, by, by at least a couple of months. Um, there's also a bunch of labs that went together in on a different purchase of intron tiling probes. <clears throat> so this is what we're putting together. Um, our, our new panel is going to have a few less genes in the, in the thousand gene range. Um, we've put it together, we've balanced it, we've done everything, and here is some head-to-head -head, 
variant calling against our current panel, and it's working you know extremely nicely. So we're quite happy with it. So, you know, as we did this project and came up with these probes and then started working together, you know, one of the things that would happen is people would be asking each other for advice about how to do that. And I thought that that was really nice to see labs actually kind of working together and sharing methods and sharing results. Um, so there's a lot more that we can do and there's a lot more that, that we're interested in doing. Um, you know, we, we can talk about what, what panels we might want to work together on. We can talk about working together on bioinformatics. And there's opportunities for, for you know, by collaborating to, to work on setting clinical standards and impacting some of the regulatory oversight that we have. I'm not going to talk about that stuff, but I'm going to talk a little bit about panel content and bioinformatics. Um, so, you know, we quickly, at the beginning, we abandoned this idea of everybody having the same panel, just because, you know, certain groups had research interests or clinical interests that were slightly different and genes of interest for their oncologists that were different and different tumor types. Um, but then we thought, well, if we don't have to have the exact same panel, maybe we could at least have the same core gene set um, that different groups would be willing to build into their panels. So, um, you know, my panel might include the core set and some of the genes and somebody else's panel might include different ones. But as long as multiple groups had the same core set, um, then we could use that core set uh, as, a, as a place to work on standardization. Um, <clears throat> so we could look at the, just the core set of genes and talk about setting standards or bioinformatics for variant calling and gene fusions, copy number alterations, or, you know, et cetera. Um, because now the probes for those genes would be the same and the gene content would be the same between multiple sites. Um, so we had a subgroup of people from six different places come together uh, and try to come up with some um, uh, you know, thoughts about what, what would be a core gene set for both solid tumor and heme malignancies. We ended up coming up with a list of uh, 497 genes that, um, you know, we thought were important. And, uh, you know, uh, about, eight of, about eight of the sites uh, have committed to building or ultimately building that core set of genes into their panel. Um, so that gives us an opportunity to do some, some interesting things. Um, so now that we have uh, some similar content, we can try to figure out how we might work together on the bioinformatics side. And bioinformatics is one of the like really tricky rate limiting steps for developing next gen sequencing tests. You have to have people who are trained in computer programming and understand uh, genomic findings and, and how to pull them out of this data. Um, and, and it's something that, you know, different institutions or I think every institution would say that they don't have enough bioinformatics support. But we've gotten to this point where everybody, every you know, place that's working on this is all doing it independently. So bioinformaticians in our lab are working on the same problems as bioinformaticians in all of these different labs. And it's not, if we, if we think of ourselves as a, as, a, as a team or at least an alliance, we're not using our informatics expertise in an efficient way. Um, and it would be nice to try to work together. And in order to do that, um, you know, perhaps working together in the cloud is the best way to go. So uh, one of the things that we've put together is a, is a subgroup of bioinformaticians from different sites who are starting to work on creating consensus pipelines and you know, software methodology comparisons and best practices. So um, we're starting to get, uh, get some progress on that. The overall thought here, if you have two different sites, um, you know, one of them could have their own panel that includes the core set of genes and their own in-house informatics pipeline and you know they're doing their own thing and, and the other site is doing the same thing with their own panel. Um, but as long as they both have the core set of genes, you could create a pipeline in the cloud um, that would be a consensus pipeline uh, for that core set of genes. And so either lab should be able then to deposit their data into that cloud-based system and run it through. And ideally, you could generate highly standardized or nearly identical results for that core set of genes. Um, and that could really be helpful. Um, and, you know, so you know, they could either choose to use it or, you know, if they liked it, they could copy it out and use it for their own in-house informatics pipeline. So we've actually started doing that um, using a system called DNA Nexus, which is a cloud-based uh, system and it's, it's provider or uh, cloud provider agnostic. So you can make your program and your data can be present in Amazon Cloud or it can be in Google Cloud or Azure. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then you can click go on the pipeline and it'll run it and it takes care of all of that under the hood stuff about where the actual data is and what system it's in. 
and that's nice because you know Brandy Cantarell from UT Southwestern is, is sort of leading this effort. And uh, at UT Southwestern, they have an a, you know an exclusive arrangement with Azure, and we don't. You know, we have you know um, I think Google or Amazon Cloud. And so you know if if different institutions have different you know cloud requirements. Um, it's hard to work together. Um, and so this sort of cloud agnostic system um, is actually really useful for, um, for being able to work together and then not have to worry so much about what cloud, where, you know, where the data is under the hood. <laughs> so we're really hoping that you know, we can, can make some progress on this issue of, of clinical standardization. Um, there's definitely this feeling in the field that all of our labs produce all these different results and it's hard to say who's doing a better job or whatever I, you know, oncologists will say, I get different results if I send it here versus here. And I think that, you know, the main reason for that type of stuff is stochastic, you know, changes or differences in what types of anomalies different labs call or, you know, differences in the actual dissection of the tissue. All oh, there's lots of ways that you know, results can be different and some of them are forgivable and, and some are not. Um, but the more we can do to show that among um, academic centers, we're actually doing a similar job and comparing and showing and publishing, the better it is for us, both for patients as well as our oncologists, but also from a national regulatory standpoint where um, we can push back on the FDA and say, no, look, look what we're doing in, in terms of, you know, showing you know, and trying to, to prove the, the quality of, of the tests that we run. So, um, meanwhile, if we're running similar stuff and have similar gene content or whatever, we can think about multi-site clinical trials in the future. We can think about opportunities for, um, you know, biomarker development across sites and concordant studies and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> so it's been an interesting project, you know, working on this and trying to uh, move it forward. You know, we've got a, a bunch of things that we're currently doing. Uh, one is expanding the group. There's no need to have it be these 17 sites. In fact, we'd be happy with any number of academic sites. Um, so we're in the process of putting together a new probe purchase. And um, if anybody's interested, just let me know. We, uh, we're putting together a probe purchase sort of focused around the, um, the secondary one is sort of focused around the core set of genes, but you know, asking for any additional gene content of interest. Um, so we have another pro purchase that should be moving forward. If it wasn't for COVID, it would already have been submitted, but, um, but hopefully we'll do that soon. That'll get the number of labs participating, you know, in our group up to about 29. And so as we've been thinking about it, Dara and I have been really interested to think about moving this sort of to a, another level, which would be to establish a, a formal infrastructure for, for the organization. And the main reason is, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities here for integrating uh, with pharma companies, you know, pharma companies who might be interested in, you know, spreading a new biomarker or test for a new biomarker across different sites uh, or doing concordant studies or, you know, pulling data from labs or whatever. And if a pharma company wants to work with a, you know, sort of a loose handshake consortium of academic sites, then it needs to have uh, legal discussions and legal agreements made independently with each of those sites, which is really difficult. So if we had an individual like um, you know, entity, which you know, we could set up that would have master agreements with each of our sites, then we could go and negotiate with a pharma company about a concordance trial or an RFA for a particular project or whatever, and all the legal stuff would be in place and we could just establish the link with the, um, the pharma company and then distribute the funds to the individual laboratories. And so, um, you know, we've been trying to, to get this started for a while now. It's been difficult, but actually we recently uh, partnered with the Association for Pathology Chairs, and they're really doing a lot to help us get this thing started. They've been really wonderful. So, um, you know, within, hopefully within the next year, we'll actually have a, like an, a formal nonprofit, which would be really great. But, you know, it's, it's obviously a lot of work. All of the, you know, um, master agreements and legal work with all these academic centers is going to be prohibitive and difficult. Um, but we're kind of modeling it on the ECOG system where there's this organization ECOG and it has all of its master agreements and uh, APC has actually uh, gotten in touch with the lawyers who helped put together ECOG and so we're, um, we're trying to work on, on doing that as well. So, you know, the goals here are just to continue to facilitate accelerated development and shared development um, across academic labs um, and nonprofit labs <coughs> and, uh, you know, see if we can facilitate some interactions between our sites and, and pharma industries. So that's where we're headed. And, um, you know, uh, you know, it, 
you or anybody else know of any groups who are interested in purchasing sets of probes or moving into capture sequencing or whatever, and, you know, let us know. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank um, first uh, Dara, who's just a, she's a great friend and a wonderful organizer. She's a, she's, a, if you don't know her, she's fairly impressive. Um, and she's really helped to do a lot of the, the groundwork for, for all of this stuff. And then just thanks to everyone at all of the different sites who are currently participating in Goal. Um, and then these are the people at University of Chicago, both faculty in our group, as well as our bioinformaticians and people who support our computational infrastructure and, of course, the laboratory staff without whom, you know, you can't do any of this work. So thank you. And if you have any questions, just uh, let me know. All right. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. That was an excellent talk. And thank you for joining us in this kind of unique remote setting during this challenging time for everybody. Um, and at this time, yeah, anybody just feel free to speak up and, and ask any questions that you might have. Any questions? Okay, I have to ask this question, even though it's going to sound dumb. Um, this is Dr. Vanessa Dayton. I'm a elderly hematopathologist at the University of Minnesota. And I am still hung up on wondering what the turnaround time was for that original patient, the 60 something year old female who, with the history of the HPV positive squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, who uh, when, when she was diagnosed with the pancreatic adenocarcinoma, you guys came up with the uh, uh, HPV signature um, uh, on next gen sequencing that, that you know, was the clue to what her uh, uh, tumor, metast her metastatic tumor in the pancreas really was. And not only am I asking, you know, hey, out of curiosity, what was the turnaround time for that? But what is your average turnaround time, your kind of your max turnaround time and your min turnaround time for getting an answer back that could help pathologists um, change their... Um, uh, strategy for making a specific diagnosis and I'll sign off. Sure. So that particular case, um, the timing uh, was not super advantageous because I don't think we got a test order until sort of substantially after uh, the pathology group had, you know, sort of rendered their, their final opinion on it. I think, you know, the, the order for our test came probably after she had received a, a treatment or two before we even got started. Um, but in terms of what our workflow is in the lab for this, um, you know, turnaround time, there are multiple ways to measure turnaround time for these tests. Um, we measure our turnaround time, uh, at least for the lab, from the point at which we get a specimen into the lab. So that means um, unstained slides reaching the lab. Now, the time that it can take to get unstained slides into the lab is variable. If it's our own case and it's an easy case and you can just cut the slides, um, you know, that could be one to two days. Um, if the material is at a different hospital and we have to request it, then, you know, things can get kind of messy. You know, there was a case recently where it took us, you know, a month and a half to get something from Northwestern because they lost the block twice and whatever, you know, so that stuff can happen. Sometimes it's hard to get stuff. Sometimes you get stuff and you cut it and you don't get enough slides and you have to go request more. So the time up front to get stuff into the lab is variable, but it can be as short as one to two days. Um, at the point that the specimen gets to the lab, it's uh, about two weeks, um, usually till uh, at least we have data to review. Our turnaround time, you know, finals time to sign out from getting a specimen to the lab is usually somewhere between eight and 15 business days. And we try to get to 10 business days um, on, on, on average, and some, you know, usually end up going over that by a day or two, but we're certainly within the two to three week time period for, for getting stuff. And if it, we want just, you know, preliminary results, we can usually do that within two weeks. Um, that's for our larger panel. We have a smaller um, Amplicon panel that we also do for rapid stuff. So we run that as well for lung cancers and for our heme cases. And that has, you know, that has KRAS and EGFR. It has IDH1 and 2 and um, NPM1 and FLT3 and stuff like that. So we run it for our new diagnosis AMLs. 
And that one we can turn around in about four to five days. Um, so we, you know, it's, I know our, our heme oncologists are interested in us turning around IDH and FLT3 and NPM1 in like 48 hours. We're not quite there yet. And it's hard to do that with next-gen sequencing. You really kind of need to move back into individual amplicon assays. But, but we're trying to do that as expedited as we can and do it in you know, four to five days or so. Um, so, you know, in, in this particular case, I think, you know, it wasn't so much our lab turnaround time. It was sort of the timing of the testing, um, you know, with that diagnosis having been rendered probably a month or more before we got the test order. So they did end up changing the diagnosis and then the patient was switched to a different regimen, but um, it wasn't, you know, even if we had been, even if we had turned around our test in one day, it still would have been sort of an issue for that particular patient. And Jeremy, this is Andy Nelson and everybody else too. So I'm, I'm also one of the molecular pathologists here, Jeremy. Um, so just wanted to basically say like we found the same thing. So commenting on that idea of turnaround time, time to diagnosis, time to results. Uh, I just want to go back to something that, that you talked about it, and it's something that we've been successful doing here, how important it is to have local molecular pathology and then have those reflex systems where you can get your surgical pathologist, your hematopathologist, ordering the test as soon as they make, you know, a preliminary assessment of the case and get that rolling because, you know, we found the same thing. I mean, it can take us even inside the system, particularly if it's one of our, our satellite hospitals like Southdale or Ridges or something. I mean, it can take a while to get slides over here, two or three days sometimes. And I mean, that's like the biggest component of, of our uh, turnaround time um, delays, even for, like you said, with our, our focused amplicon panels and our faster stuff. So, um, I yeah, mean, it's just, definitely an issue. <laughs> and the reflex testing, I agree. I totally agree. The reflex testing is the best way to do it because for the, we often, you know, we, we, we've done a lot of stuff with the FNA service. So we do, um, we do a lot of our molecular testing off of the smears themselves. And so, you know, the patient will go in, they'll get the FNA, the cytology group will see the FNA. So actually change the procedures a little bit. So they do, um, more passes until they get a molecular suitable FNA smear yeah. um, because there were we had some issues with our cell blocks like you know, we had a lot of arguments with cell blocks they would they would originally get diagnostics on the slide but not enough for molecular and then they do multiple passes for the for the cytolite for the cell block and then if the cell block turned out bad it would be an argument between cytology and the FNA crew you know well you missed it I didn't miss it it was the same place you know there was a lot of that so um, so we focus now on the slides and just making sure we get a good smear. But once they do that, they can just send the slide over to the lab and we'll get the slide on the same day and we can just start the test. And often that's even before they've actually had their first um, oncology appointment. And so yep. um, that's the way to do it. And Have you, with the reflex testing, have you been successful in, in doing it both on your more focused, faster panels as well as the larger uh, hybrid capture panel? The reflex, at least for the lung, the reflex is um, to do all three panels. So the, sh the yeah. small focused one, the bigger one, and the RNA one. Um, and so we'll try to turn out the EGFR and the KRAS in, you know, four to five days, follow it up the following week with the large panel results, and probably a week after that with the RNA results. Okay. And then just uh, on, on goal consortium, I... Forgot because also like you, a molecular oncology, molecular pathologist that got conscripted into COVID. Um, I just emailed Dara. I, I realized I hadn't ever responded to her last email, um, oh. but but we're a hundred percent in. Um, okay. So uh, okay. for for the next purchase, are you guys still doing any content modification of the core set, or is it locked down yet? Well, the core set itself is kind of locked down, but if you wanted to add genes to it that you wanted to add to your own thing, then just send send them to us and we'll just yeah. send them to the order. Yeah, we, I just got some feedback from some of our neuro-oncology and neurosurgeons and some other folks, so uh, I'll try and take a look at What are you guys doing? Uh, we have three different instruments. So, you know, we, because of supply chain uh, backups uh, on Cepheid and Diasorin, we had to come up with a, a lab developed procedure just using an RTQ PCR using the CDC primer probe set. We got the RUOs from IDT because there's no issues. Uh, we actually had uh, family members of people who are on this call undoubtedly drive Promega Master Mix from Wisconsin over here. Um, wow. so, so we could manage to pull together a RUO LDT in about five days. Um, so we got that out the door late March. 
Uh, we luckily got started supply chains coming in for the FDA kits, uh, both of the FDA boxes. So we have right now about a 400, 500 per day test capacity, which actually because of the clampdowns on who gets tested, we're, we're not even entirely using right now. But now the big, the big thing is, is you know, we're, we're still, we've got six different extraction kits uh, validated for the LDP, um, but we, we still are kind of worried about, you know, just it takes a large army to do that many extractions in a day to do 2,000, you know, manual extractions a day. Uh, so we're, we're trying to, you know, do some experimentation with some extractionless direct RT, qPCR, things like that to see if we can have a more rapid, um, more rapid turnaround time or, or more frankly, just a, a, a bigger throughput. Um, and Cepheid may come through with, with more kits too. So, um, yeah. you know, we'll see. So that's brutal. Yeah. Our, our, the most of the majority of our testing is being done by the microbiology lab where most of the virology stuff is run. So like my lab hasn't been doing any of it until now. And it's this DD PCR thing. I don't know. We'll just have to see. I have a funny feeling that the real reason that, um, there's a sensitivity gap with testing is not the assay itself. It's, you know, it's the sample. It's you know? sample collection. Yeah. We've seen that time and time again. I'm sure Pat, if she's on the phone can, can comment too. It's, it's all about sample collection and just the normal biology of the disease. It's, it's yeah. very little to do with the underlying assay. I totally agree. But hey, any last questions? Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks so Thanks much, everybody. Guys.